Well, here we are. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, whatever, to all our colleagues uh, from the business. Uh, my name is Antonio. Most of you uh, already know me. I'm from the AQ Sales Department. And today uh, we are here enjoying this webinar online uh, about IP Codex. We hope uh, you find our contents of use. And we'll try to go through several subjects like uh, interconnectivity and uh, connectivity methods and uh, encodings, uh, STLs. I think it's going to be a quite interesting uh, session. And uh, luckily, I'm going to have today with me my colleague uh, Sergio. Sergio Sanchez, he's uh, from the engineering department at AEQ. So here is my colleague Sergio. Hi, Antonio. Hi, everyone. And uh, Sergio is going to help us with all the technical issues, as I always said. At the end of the seminar, we'll run a, a small or long, as you prefer, uh, questions and answers uh, time. And as I always tell you, enjoy the questions and answers time because Sergio is with us. And Sergio is the man to ask all the difficult questions. So thank you, uh, Sergio. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, we are not enjoying today the presence of our colleague um, Jason Yang from uh, Taiwan uh, that he was in charge of, a, of uh, an installation and a case that he prepared for us uh, with a multiple unicast uh, uh, STL uh, studio transmitters links which is the case that I believe can be repeated all around the world in many many radio stations but in any case uh, we are lucky we have Sergio with us and Sergio will be in, in, in charge of introducing this case uh, for us and and overall enjoy the questions and answers because it's, it's where you can uh, take advantage of his presence and our presence so without any more delay just uh, uh, making you understand and we understand that the problems and the and the situation the world is running with this pandemic and uh, we are here to to support you whatever you need from us from AEQ uh, we will be there to help you. Uh, and without any more delay, let's see if I can start. Uh, oops. If I can start with the PowerPoint launching. Because I, sorry, but I, sorry, mates, I have on the screen like 20 things. Uh, okay. Let's go for it. So in the in today's webinar, the the um, the outline, the index, or what we're going to run is uh, basically what is an IP codec, which is something very simple, which is an encoding. Oops, sorry, I'm doing. Uh, let me just have the PowerPoint on site, prepare, finish it. Okay. So uh, encoding algorithms. How can I uh, connect to my my audio codec? Uh, Uses cases in which uh, Sergio will be uh, the key person that he will be showing us uh, how the codecs work and how the codecs interconnect. I think it's going to be very, very interesting. So with a couple of cases, the first one is uh, about uh, Sarsa. It's a radio station and a radio network in Catalonia. And I think uh, it's going to be of interest. Uh, Sergio later on will show us the Phoenix control, the AQ Phoenix control software. That is a very easy and very simple to use codec uh, control software and finally we'll uh, have a look at the another case study from Taiwan from a Taiwanese radio station uh, in which you will see a small case of multiple unicast that I believe will be of interest for you so just uh, in case uh, you have is the first time you see AEQ or you are in contact with AEQ that is uh, that is always possible uh, AQ has been developing, manufacturing and selling equipment for the last uh, 40 years in the broadcast. Uh, the range of equipment we manufacture is uh, on audio and video uh, and communications uh, for radio and television. Uh, AQ has been also present in the sport events like Olympic Games and uh, World Cups and many other sport events, Commonwealth Games, uh, Athletics. For the last 30 years also, uh, AQ developed the first digital commentary system in the world. And now we're in the, our third generation of commentary systems. AQ is based in Madrid and is uh, we're having offices in the United States, Mexico, Portugal, and India, 
among other countries and having distributors and clients around the world, company with a world base. And in this moment, we are here to help all our customers and friends in the broadcast industry in finding solutions to continue working with normality. Without any more delay, we move into the first uh, piece of information, which is uh, what is an IP audio codec. An IP audio codec is the, the, the evolution of the old uh, digital audio codecs that were working on ISDN lines. Uh, AQ started developing audio codecs, and before the ISDN lines, even on B.35, X21, this is old, old, old transmission method that probably some people can recall and remember from the very old days of digital audio. And AQ started in the 90s, uh, the last century, with the digital audio encoding in the old-fashioned MPEG layer 2 codecs. And from there, we migrated into from the video 35 into the ISDN with a set of equipment. Uh, and from the ISDN, now the, the, final, the final path or the final uh, equipment is uh, IP. We have migrated into IP everything. So an audio codec is a device that encodes audio in analog, in digital, and lately in IP audio. Put that into the line, into compress it, into the funnel, send it through the lines. What are the lines? The lines could be, as I mentioned in the old days, ISDN, X21, B35, uh, and nowadays uh, could be, um, nowadays could be into WiMAX, uh, Wirelands, 3G, 4G, 5G, Wi-Fi, internet, and decodes on the other end. The objective is to perform an audio transmission through an IP network between two different locations with high quality and low delay. High quality and low delay, this is the key. Um, so. We are having audio from somewhere there. So the encoding algorithm is uh, the mathematical procedure that is used by the codex, uh, which takes all these linear audio. Some people, they ask is, why don't do everything to the linear audio? Well, it's, it's complicated. Sergio can explain you, but it's complicated because the linear audio is uh, something uh, of big capacity, a big size. So this is why we need to compress it. Uh, in coming to compression, the history of compression has undergone through different uh, periods. We started in the ISO MPEG. Uh, we migrated into the four suit bands, uh, ADPCM, uh, and, uh, and four suit bands, ADPCM algorithms. Uh, now, now we are in the in in a new generation of codecs, which is, uh, for instance, Opus. It's a versatile, open, extremely efficient coding algorithm, free of license. That we are. Uh, is our preference nowadays since the ones we are promoting in the in, in the new generation of codecs. This is our experience with Opus uh, when uh, this is a codec that in the blind listening test results uh, from the blind the, in the blind uh, in the listening test because it's the way to evaluate a coding algorithm by by listening. In the listening test, it has achieved better results than uh, other encoding algorithms like AAC, G722, MP3, and it's uh, using from very, very little bandwidth, like uh, from 12 kilobytes per second, just from, from 12 kilobytes per second mono, up to 192 kilobytes or even more, and up to uh, Opus can provide you very good uh, audio quality and no need of coming to linear audio, which is uh, 2.3. So I was telling you in the you can find all the information about Opus Codec uh, in opuscodec.org. And here is uh, the reasons, one of the reasons why AQ is choosing this codec. So in any case, without any more delay, I would like to invite my colleague Sergio to start introducing you uh, the types of connectivities, the types of connectivities uh, that we have into the, into the codex algorithms. So, here is all for you, Sergio. I'll come back in a minute. Okay, thank you, Antonio. Okay, so Antonio uh, saw you before. What's an audio codec? Uh, what it is uh, used for? Uh, what's an encoding algorithm and everything else? And now I'm going to show you how to make the connections. That is finally what you need to do uh, to establish a communication. 
So, uh, we will start by introducing SIP. Uh, SIP stands for Session Initiation Protocol and it's a standard or a de facto standard uh, described in uh, RFC 3261. Anyway, it's a protocol for negotiation uh, of uh, multimedia uh, communication. So it's uh, used for not only for audio, but also for video, for messaging, etc. But we will focus on its uh, audio usage. Okay, so uh, what uh, SIPs, uh, SIP does is, uh, is the connection uh, procedure uh, to the user. So uh, if, we, if we rely on an external uh, SIP server, as we call it, uh, we we uh, we can forget about the IP addresses, ports, and, and everything else, and we can just uh, establish the connections uh, using names. Okay, so each unit, uh, each audio codec, registers in a, in this SIP server. Okay, with a, with a single name, a unique name, and then in order to make the connection from codec A to codec B, we just have to dial uh, this this name. Okay, in this picture we can see how this works. Okay, you can uh, you can see the black uh, dashed line. Uh, this represents the, the negotiation of the communication, and as you can see, it is established only between its end and the SIP server. Okay, so codec A, in order to call to codec B, uh, communicates uh, with the SIP server, okay, and the SIP server in turn communicates with, with codec B, and uh, once the uh, negotiation is performed the audio can travel directly from codec A to codec B. This is represented in the, represented, sorry, in the red line. Okay, and it's worth uh, noting that uh, in the end, uh, audio travels using another protocol that is called RTP that we will uh, see later on. Okay, and this is the basic structure of uh, the typical uh, structure of a uh, SIP using a, a SIP server. Okay, there is a variation of this uh, that we can see in next uh, next uh, slide called uh, RTP relay. Okay, in RTP relay, uh, everything works uh, just the same as before, but once the communication is established, the audio travels through the SIP server. Okay, the SIP server does RTP relay. Okay, so uh, in, uh, what is this for? Okay, uh, this is used. Um, when certain problems arise uh, in the internet, uh, depending on the operator, depending on the routers used, etc., uh, the user might may, may find that the communication cannot be properly established, or maybe in one of the direction it doesn't work, etc. So in this case, we uh, can choose a RTP relay server that solves all these problems, and uh, the communication is established uh, properly. Okay. Uh, in next slide, we will um, just explain, just for uh, the sake of uh, completion, the, the last uh, variation of a uh, SIP that doesn't rely on an external server. That's why we call it the direct SIP. And it's uh, a case where negotiation is performed directly between the involved codecs. Okay, so codec A calls codec B, and uh, a negotiation using SIP protocol starts. Um, okay, in this case, uh, we still preserve some of the advantages of using SIP. Uh, so um, the, the audio algorithm is automatically negotiated and the call is established by directionally. Okay, but uh, we need to know the IP address of the remote end. So, uh, as you can imagine, this mode is not very widely used and it's only explained just for completion and as uh, I said, and um, because sometimes you need to use it when you need to communicate different brands of uh, devices, okay, as a compatibility mode. Okay, next uh, we will present RTP. Uh, RTP stands for a real, a real time protocol and it's a protocol based on UDP and it's designed to um, to transfer uh, multimedia, uh, let it be uh, audio, messaging, or video, uh, in a in a real time context. Okay, so it's very widely uh, widely used to transfer audio in this case from uh, one location to another, even through the internet. Okay, and it doesn't require any additional protocols uh, to perform this communication. But it is a very simple uh, implementation. Uh, this, the standard implementation is 
it's quite uh, simple and it's uh, unidirectional. And also you need to know not only the IP address and the port of the remote end, but you also need to agree on the audio coding algorithm that is used in both ends, so they understand each other, okay? So in order to make a bidirectional communication, that is what you usually would need, uh, you need to call from codec A to codec B uh, to the uh, specified IP address and port, okay? You need to, uh, previously, you need to agree on the coding algorithm configured in both sides, and then you need to make another call from codec B to, con to codec A to its uh, on IP address and um, port also. So you, you have to know both IP addresses and ports, and you need, of course, to agree on the coding algorithm. So as you can imagine, uh, this is quite uh, messy. Uh, to, to make a, a call, it can get a bit tricky. You need to know a lot of data, and it can take a long, a long time. So it's not used uh, commonly for making communications. But uh, we... Uh, as we noticed that uh, it can be a very powerful tool to, to make communications, we uh, decided to uh, improve it and made a set of uh, new tools that it's uh, that they are uh, incorporated in our, in our, our codecs for, for free, of course. Uh, we call it a smart TP, and it's uh, only an option that you check. And then um, making an RTP call is very, uh, very easy because uh, in order to make a call, you only need to call from codec A to codec B using uh, still its IP address and port, but the, the, uh, the coding algorithm is uh, automatically negotiated. Okay, so uh, codec B automatically sets its coding algorithm as the same that uh, codec A is using, and also the call is returned automatically to the incoming address. So you don't need to make an, a second call from codec B to codec A. Uh, and you don't need to, to know its IP address, okay? So making the, the call is quite simple, as we will see later on in an example, in a lib example uh, with our control software. And well, the advantage is that uh, you, don't use, you don't use a SAP protocol on top of this, so the problems that uh, sometimes are associated with that protocol, uh, especially over internet and uh, with some kinds of routers, uh, are automatically eliminated, and uh, you only need to make usually a, a small configuration in one of the routers to, to make calls in a secure and safe uh, uh, manner. Okay, so I now it, mm, give pass to, to Antonio again that they okay. will explain you uh, our policy with the SIP servers and okay. explain to a bit of our problems. Yes, Sergio, thank you very much for introducing introducing us the, to the types of connectivity, the SIPs, the RTP, and uh, don't go very far away because uh, now uh, you will explain us how that works uh, in reality at the end. So uh, just to summarize the situation, uh, as, as Sergio was telling you, we have the SIP servers, uh, which is uh, the, the more simple way uh, to establish IP calls between uh, codecs, uh, has its complexities, has its uh, questions, has its uh, uh, tricks, but at the end is the more simple way because uh, you don't need to need uh, to know IP addresses, you don't need to know about ports, you don't need to know about uh, many, many network uh, networking matters. So just as a matter of information, AQ provides uh, a free SIP account in AQ servers. Uh, we have uh, two servers. Uh, one is based in Madrid, another one is in the cloud in redundancy. So both clouds uh, or both servers are, are to work in, in uh, redundancy to provide you connectivity between all the AQ devices and between all the third party devices. So uh, in addition, if the customers uh, or the clients you are having another devices from another manufacturers uh, or SIP phones or whatever, uh, AQ can provide you SIP uh, SIP numbers, SIP names that you can use to interconnect the devices, the equipment. And at the end, we like to highlight that AQ is also, uh, we're having our own RTP relay server, uh, which is the server that is going to be able to give you in these complex cases when you have problems. Uh, what is the more typical experience we have with this, uh, with our clients in the in China, in the basketball match, in the basketball championship, for instance, they were using a lot our RTP relay server. 
uh, when you have a lot of problems in the communications, when you don't have, because basically you, you lose the control over the RTP flow, what Sergio was explaining, the, the flow, the communication flow between the two places, it happens to all of us in every day on the, on the IP calls, on WhatsApp, on Skype, on this. Uh, we lose the control. We connect with somebody, but then we lose the control of the flow. That in the professional field is uh, happily or luckily is solved by the RTP relay server that allows you through AEQ to have full control of the communication. So you can establish a, a, a very strong communication path that is secure for you. So just before I leave uh, Sergio on the on the control again to give us more information about the the, the uses of the codex, STLs and many others and the cases, just to remind you that uh, AQ is working on uh, Mercury, Venus 3 and Stratos as our standalone codex uh, or codex for studio, rack mounted, and the Alio that is our portable device that we'll have a look later. Now I think the more interesting is that uh, we I asked my colleague Sergio, uh, provided that is here, to enlighten us and uh, show us some information about how do you establish an STL uh, working in different conditions, because STL is a very typical case of IP codex. So the STL, the studio transmitter links, how can we have different transmission methods like VLAN, Wi-Fi antennas, or we go by the wired internet, uh, how we can build a distribution and contribution of audio, like in the case that we will see later from the Taiwanese restaurant, Taiwanese uh, uh, radio station. And then we'll have a look at uh, mobile or portable uses and uh, with the correspondence, the typical case of working from home with an IP codec and the stationary uses uh, of uh, with a SIP uh, connector, with a with telephone connections in intercom systems for television. So without any more delay, I will ask Sergio to introduce us to these uh, cases and applications because he's the one who knows. So Sergio, all yours, please. Okay, I'm here again. Okay, so uh, I will now try to explain you a few uh, typical uh, usage uh, scenarios. And we will start with STLs. STLs stands for a Studio to Transmitter Link. And you know it's a, a, the way we use to send audio program from a studio where the audio is produced to the uh, transmitter site. Okay, that may be remote, in a mountain or, or whatever. Okay, and these are usually very stable connections, uh, even 24-7 connections and uh, they can rely on a variety of uh, physical uh, connections okay they can be done by means of uh, microwave uh, links uh, they can be uh, done by uh, wired internet uh, higher uh, connections from uh, from one operator they can be done with a uh, white max even even with a 3g or 4g uh, uh, mobile connection so there are a variety of uh, connections uh, first, we will start with a simple, uh, simple topology that, uh, uh, of, uh, at least uh, from the user point of view, that is using VLANs. Okay, VLAN is a virtual local area network. VLAN is a service that you can uh, hire from your uh, internet provider, and it's uh, like a virtual um, network uh, for your own usage. Okay, and the advantage uh, the advantage of this is that all the devices in that VLAN uh, are connected just like if uh, they were on the same uh, physical network. Uh, they share the IP address range usually, so it's uh, very simple to make connections. So, if you want to make an audio link from uh, the studio to the to the transmitter side, of course you need an audio codec in each uh, location, and in order to send the audio, you just, you can just uh, use RTP because the, the IPs are known and, and fixed, and you can may just call from codec A in the studio to the codec in the transmitter side, but it's uh, IP address and port. And uh, using smart RTP, as I explained before, the connection is established by direction in, in case that you are interested in the audio from the transmitter to the studio. It may be useful for, useful for you or not. Okay. Uh, so this, uh, this uh, topology makes things very easy. Uh, in terms of, of control, of course, we always recommend to have 
remote control of uh, all the codecs in your installation, and you can control both of them from the studio. That is the typical case. And in order to do that, you just need to uh, run the auto discover option of the codec that we will see later on, or just add the IP address of the local codec and also of the transmitter side codec. So this makes uh, things uh, very, very, very simple. Okay, you don't need to use SIP in this case uh, because, uh, as I, I said before, uh, you already know the IP addresses and ports, and you can even create uh, simple contacts in your call books in your codec. So you don't need to remember the IP addresses. You can use the contact names, and that's it. You don't need to rely on external infrastructure. Okay. Okay. In this slide. <clears throat> um, we can uh, we will explain how to do this uh, uh, with uh, microwave links. Uh, just to explain that, uh, microwave links are a technology using radio frequency. Uh, in the in the recent past, um, a lot of uh, solutions have appeared in the market uh, using very inexpensive, very cheap uh, antenna pairs that you can use to make links in IP. Uh, uh, with long range, uh, we are talking about maybe uh, 10, 20, 30 kilometers long, as, lo uh, as long as you have direct line of sight, okay, with a very respectable speed. So, and they can be used for, for making links as long as your uh, transmitter site is uh, visible from the, from the studio, okay. Uh, in this case, uh, there is no VLAN, but it's uh, simply a LAN, a local area network, because uh, the antennas uh, behave like a simple Ethernet cable. Okay, so it's uh, just the same as uh, if uh, you had all the codecs in the same switch. So you can use the same IP address range, and you can connect everything as I explained before in the VLAN. You can still still use smart TP. You can still use a remote control simply by adding the IP address of the codex, and everything is, is very simple. Okay, uh, these antennas, they are usually um, using uh, free bands, free frequency bands, and uh, this makes them very popular and very cheap. But uh, in the latest uh, installations that we have uh, seen from our customers, uh, some of them have complained about uh, lack of reliability of the connection sometimes maybe uh, they work for a long time uh, very well but uh, without previous notice they have uh, caps or they have uh, salads and uh, after some investigation they found that they had uh, intentional or non-intentional accidental uh, interference okay this is because the um, frequency bands are free are open to everybody so they decided to move to more elaborate, more expensive solutions uh, that are uh, based uh, are uh, using license uh, bands. So they have to, to pay for a license to, to use uh, this uh, frequency band. And, and uh, of course, in this case, you don't have interference from, from other people. And OK, the, the cost is higher for these links, but they are much more reliable. So this is our uh, the advice we are getting from our customers. Okay. Okay. So uh, let's move to next scenario that is also very common and very uh, popular because uh, internet is available virtually everywhere in the world. So uh, as long as you have a proper uh, internet connection using ADCL or fiber or whatever, you can also make an STL quite uh, reliably. Okay. Uh, but it, ha it has some um, drawbacks or, or some things you need to show. Okay? Uh, in this picture, we see that uh, in the studio, we have a, a similar situation uh, as before. We have a, a switch where we have our uh, audio codec and the control PC and uh, any other uh, IP equipment connected. This switch is connected to a router that uh, gives access to the internet. Okay? We have virtually the same in the transmitter side. Okay, we can also have, we, we will also have a router to provide access to the internet. Uh, and we may have a switch uh, to connect the, the audio codec, but also other equipment. Okay, the thing about this is that we have two separate uh, local area networks, typically. At least, at least in the studio, you will have a local area network behind the router. And, and the router is performing what we call 
Network Address, uh, address Translation, NAT. Okay, so uh, the IP addresses of the codec of the PC of, uh, for control, etc., won't be visible from the other side, from the transmitter side, and the same uh, uh, the same way around. Okay, uh, so we only see the public IP uh, address of the studio and the public IP address of the transmitter side. Okay, so in order to uh, make connections, we will always need to call to the public IP addresses. Okay, but uh, as I explained to you before, uh, if you remember, if we will use if, if we use uh, RTP uh, without uh, smart RTP, we will need to uh, call from one side to the other and also the other way around. So sometimes the IP address of the uh, uh, the public IP address of the uh, transmitter side is not fixed or is not known or whatever. So it is, uh, wouldn't be valid. Okay, but if you use a smart RTP option, you can always make the call from the transmitter side to the studio, okay? Because the uh, public IP of the studio is usually fixed, and this is something you, you should recommend and recommend to your customer or to your IP manager. Okay, the public ID, uh, public IP address of the studio should be fixed, and in this case, if you make the call from the transmitter side to this public IP, okay, you can reach the studio codec with a very simple configuration of the studio router okay you will need to make a small configuration as we said a call a port forward just to uh, direct a given port to the ip address of the audio codec so if we call to the public ip address of the studio and this given port okay the audio from the transmitter side will reach the audio codec in the studio and the audio coding in the studio using a smart TP will return the flow, the audio flow towards the transmitter side. That is really what we are interested in, the audio from the studio to the transmitter. Okay, so this way the call is uh, make, made very easily without relying on external SIP server or whatever. Okay, but uh, there is a small drawback, drawback uh, about this, is that uh, uh, sometimes the transmitter side is unattended or you don't want anyone there to make the call towards the studio. You, you want to control everything from the studio, okay? But fortunately, uh, our codecs uh, also have an option uh, to allow for control uh, actively, actively from the audio codec to the control PC, okay? So in the same way that I, as we uh, did with the audio, we can configure the transmitter side audio codec to make a control connection towards the public IP of the studio. And we make uh, a small redirection in the router for the control port towards the PC uh, for control, okay? So in this way, we can easily control uh, both audio codecs from the same PC in the studio, and we can make the call from the remote end towards the studio very easily, okay? So, with, uh, as you can see, with some small configuration that we will, of course, help you doing, and that uh, any uh, skilled uh, IP, uh, IP manager, IP manager, will do very easily and only once. You can have full control of both of the codecs, and you can have audio from one side to another without relying on standard servers or and with total control. Okay. As we said, it's very important that the uh, public IP in the studio is static, is fixed. Okay, this is usually available from most providers at a very low cost. Okay. Okay, Sergio. Okay, so very interesting the matter of the STLs, which is a very typical key case uh, that we will see later. And thank you for all these explanations about the possible ways to, to put the audio from A to B from a studio to transmitter. Um, let me just uh, introduce you that uh, we're going to have a look at a new case, uh, our first case today, which is a real case that AQ has been working uh, on for the last uh, few years. It's a radio station in, in uh, Catalonia, a radio network in Catalonia, in the north uh, east of Spain, uh, where AQ has been working for years in developing a um, distribution, audio distribution network uh, that uh, uh, to make their way of operating easier than in the old days uh, in which they were using satellites and we have migrated all that into IP. 
So, without any more delay, I'm just letting again Sergio to go ahead with this and explain you how this works, and we'll come back later. Please, Sergio. Okay. Hello, Ben. <coughs> well, as Antonio introduced, introduced you, uh, Exercise uh, is a network of radios uh, based on Barcelona, that is the capital of uh, Catalonia. Catalonia is the north of Spain, and they have a, a head office there in Barcelona, as I told you, and they have over uh, 200 uh, link uh, local stations. Okay, so what they want to do is uh, to produce uh, programs in Barcelona and then send them to all the locations, all the all the radio stations, and in order to do that, uh, before they use uh, satellite links. Okay, uh, so they have they have a transmitter in Barcelona. Uh, they use an audio codec uh, to send uh, the compressed audio uh, to the transmitter via uh, IP, but uh, through the uh, uplink in the satellite, and then the satellite covered all the geographical area of uh, Catalonia, and then uh, every um, station needed to have to have a, a satellite receive, receiver connected to an, another audio codec to decode, to receive the audio and decode it, and put it into their mixing console, and add the local advertisement, or whatever they needed to do to, to broadcast the, the local programs okay uh, okay this, this uh, works but is as you can imagine very very expensive satellite links are very expensive and uh, there is another drawback is that uh, they couldn't have uh, feedback from the uh, stations towards the the, the the head office okay because in, in order to do that they will need to have transmitters uh, satellite transmitters in all the stations uh, receiver in the head office hide a lot of new uh, satellite links and it would be impractical. Okay, so decide, they decided to move to IP. So uh, in next slide, we can see uh, what they are doing. Okay, we help them install uh, all, all this. Uh, and what they have is, uh, in the picture, you can see that at the left, uh, they have Barcelona headquarters installation that is based on a, a pool of audio codecs, in this case they are Vinus 3 a dual IP audio codecs from AQ <coughs> that are connected to a BC2000 uh, audio matrix, all of them, and then they have the mixing, mixing consoles, etc. Okay, uh, and uh, what they do is um, transmit uh, the main uh, program, national program, towards all the local stations using multicast. Okay, so they rely on the telco network, and, and this telco network is Hive, it's a dedicated uh, network, and it's uh, compatible with multicast, with IEMP uh, protocol, and its uh, bandwidth is uh, dimension uh, to support all the aggregate uh, traffic uh, due to the multicast to uh, nearly 200 stations. So at the left of the picture, you can see the extractor of the simple local station, only only one. Uh, it's uh, connected to the to the telco network. Uh, they use a router, okay, and this router uh, connects to uh, the Vin uh, Venus uh, Venus Three uh, audio codec to a control PC to another video decoder and everything uh, they have there, okay. Also for uh, informatics and things like that. Okay, and they use the uh, Venus 3 audio codec um, channel one to receive the uh, main national program. And this uh, program goes to the mixer or to the transmitter or whatever they, they want to do with the program. And they use channel two uh, for making point-to-point uh, uh, -point connections towards headquarters in Barcelona or even between different stations. Okay, so channel one is used for multicast receiving and channel two is used for contribution or communications. <clears throat> okay, well, uh, to give some more detail, in Barcelona, they have two main, uh, sorry, two uh, program uh, audio codecs, one is main and one is backup for redundancy, and it's used to broadcast the multicast national program, as I told you. Then they have another five contribution audio codecs that make up to 10 uh, contribution calls that can be uh, received or made, made uh, simultaneously for uh, creating programs locally. 
and then they have another five of the products uh, for uh, multicast. They, they can create um, a smaller uh, multicast groups for regional programs, etc. Okay, this is something they, they also uh, need. Okay, um, now with the, the permission and, uh, and not without uh, thanking them for, uh, for allowing us to, to connect, I, we will make a leap a connection to uh, the installations, uh, the installation they have. Okay, so okay, as you can see there, uh, we are now seeing uh, the control software that is uh, called Control Phoenix. This is the software we provide for free with all, all of our audio codecs. But in this case, as they are controlling a very large number of codecs, they are using the registered version. Uh, they they pay a they pay the license, and then they have an unlimited number of uh, codecs to be controlled with the software. If, if we use if you use the the free uh, version uh, you can control up to two audio products at the same time okay so as you can see the the, the particularity of this installation is that that they have many codecs so they are using the list list mode okay in this mode each line represents an audio codec uh, and each line has some structure at the left you have an icon showing the connection strat uh, status then you have the description name that we provide to each audio codec, the IP address, and then you have two blocks showing the status of uh, uh, each channel, channel one and channel two. Uh, you can see in green where it is connected, uh, where it is connected. Uh, you can see the on air status, the receive and transmit audio status, it's like they are audio detectors, LX and PX, and the same for the other channel. Okay, of course, if you want to have more detail about one of the codecs, you can just click on it and you will have a, a more detailed uh, version of the, of the view. And you can see more detailed status here. You can make an, an, an hang up calls if you want here. You can check view meters, etc. And if you want, you can also access a detailed configuration clicking on this config button. Okay, you will have full control over the audio codecs, you can control everything from the analog or digital input mode, the coding algorithm used, uh, the transmit status. Uh, you can you can also um, adjust the IP address, the the connection options like uh, auto answer. You can uh, make the, the calls permanent, so they are automatically recovered if uh, something fails, etc. All the details in the audio codec can be controlled from here. Okay. Uh, well, it's worth noting that they, they are using, as you can see, Opus as their primary connection algorithm because they are very happy with the bandwidth it uses. It's important, very important in this case, because as they are using, they are using multicast, uh, they pay for the bandwidth the, the network is dimension four, so they, they have to dimension the, the total aggregate bandwidth. And as uh, the smaller it is for a single connection, the smaller it will be for the whole installation. So in this case, they are going with only 192 kilobits per second for full uh, broadcast quality audio. Also with very low delay. So they are very happy with this uh, algorithm. Okay, uh, as you can imagine, uh, managing such a large network, network may be difficult sometimes when you want to locate one codec. That's why uh, we create some tools in this uh, in this uh, software. For example, if you want to locate one of the stations, you just type the name here, start typing it, and it will automatically filter the list uh, for the codecs matching this uh, wildcard. Let's call it this way. For example, if you want to to control the uh, canet, you start typing canet. Okay, and when you finish, you only have a uh, canet. So then you have it here and you can click on it and control it, okay? So it's uh, quite convenient for making uh, a small integrations in uh, single codecs. Okay, you can also organize the codecs in groups. Uh, you, you can define the, the groups previously and as you can see, they have uh, here like four groups, locals, contribution, Pruebas, tests, and multicast, and you can click on anyone, and then only the codecs in that group are uh, displayed, so you can more easily work with them. Okay, if you want to return to the full view, you can just click on all, 
and all of the codecs are displayed again. Okay, so uh, this is how they work, how they manage the, this uh, large installation of codecs. As you can see, the software is quite flexible. You can work with a lot of codecs or with very uh, small quantities of one or two codecs if you want. And later on, uh, I will explain you more details about, about this software uh, working with a small number of codecs. Okay, but uh, I think that uh, for this moment, this is enough with, with the SARSA installation. And I want to thank you, to thank them, sorry, again for giving us this opportunity to show how they work and uh, what they did. Okay. Okay. And, so uh, this is very good. Very good, Sergio. Thanks to SARSA. Thank you very much to our colleagues and friends in Barcelona in Catalonia to allow us to show you this uh, his installation that Sergio is handling uh, in a very precise and wise uh, way from Madrid and uh, if you want to see more information about this is uh, this is this case is fully published in our website where you can see all the details about this uh. so just to finish as Sergio was uh, explaining you uh, they changed from an only distribution network uh, with a satellite app link that was in Barcelona into with multiple down, down links that you were uh, working on a satellite unidirectional only distribution network and they changed uh, thanks to the IP codex and thanks to the strong powerful network that they rented from Telefonica telecom company they are still working on the same as the satellite with unidirectional uh, unidirectional link but the big advantage is that suddenly they could also have bidirectional links as you can see here in the in this middle map uh, where they were changing from distribution into also adding contribution and uh, also they were running multiple links this is the final array of codecs at the bottom that uh, Sergio was explaining in the previous uh, slide uh, oh. Oh. This is, sorry, I made a mistake with my mouse. Uh, this uh, group of codecs that you saw here in the multi, uh, they, they are program, contribution, and multi codecs. Uh, this small part uh, is to provide these multiple links. So if they want to do a small groups of stations, like for instance, they want to group some stations in one province, they can do everything through Barcelona. So these links are independent. So from only distribution, thanks to this IP migration, from only distribution, which is the typical uh, distribution that we used to see in the radio stations years ago, in the radio networks, into distribution, contribution, and multiple. So, uh, thanks to Sarsa and Sergio again. So, we're going to see a small, another case, uh, which is the uh, OB correspondence, commentators or broadcast connected broadcasters, uh, outside broadcast people, outside uh, correspondence, uh, commentators connected by ADSL or fiber. So this is uh, the typical application of working from home that we are enjoying these days, uh, thanks to these applications like uh, go to webinars, Zoom, whatever. Um, the same can be done in a professional manner, in a professional way with the IP codex. Uh, we can have the commentators working from home, our talents uh, working uh, with IP codecs like the Alio, for instance, and AQ, and that audio in high quality can be received in the radio station. Uh, they can use uh, C-Prosy, RTP, whatever communication method to connect to the console. This is something that, unfortunately, due to these pandemic uh, days uh, or pandemic times, they have it has spread all around the world. And here there is some samples of uh, our colleagues from radio stations working from home uh, in, in their pyjama pants, but with a microphone and uh, in their home, cloud, uh, home clothes. But at the end, everything sounds like if they were in the station because they are using professional uh, transmitter equipment like the Alio, for instance. In this case, we have uh, hundreds of pictures of our colleagues uh, working from home in, the, in their Alios. Uh, also, uh, linking with the Alio, uh, we find also the in the outside broadcast, which is the the opposite case to the STL, in which everything is there and everything is established. In the in the Alio, we can folk, we can find the the situation that we are in the middle of nowhere without any kind of ADSL line. This is very typical nowadays. Television guys they are running this way with the outside broadcast by 
using uh, backpacks full of uh, SIM cards. In case of audio, luckily, it's a little bit easier than with the with the backpacks and television uh, and video transmission. We just we need one uh, router, one simple router, which is a portable modem and router 4G, working uh, connected to the directly to the Alio. And uh, AQ has opted to put this equipment out, so this way you have the freedom to choose your own modem that you can buy anywhere around the world on reasonable prices, on reasonable cost. And you can also now, uh, for instance, here it talks about 3G, 4G, we can also use it 5G. If I think if you go to Singapore and some areas of Madrid and many cities in the world where you can achieve a 5G, uh, you can use one of these external uh, 5G modems and immediately the AEQ is working on 5G. Uh, at the end, what we say is, uh, what we recommend is not to overload the transmission with too much uh, flow of information, but just to use a good audio coding algorithm that is providing the maximum quality with the minimum bandwidth. This way you will have a good performance. And this is uh, some examples that we want to show of this uh, kind of operation. Some colleagues from Australia from Hills Radio in Adelaide Hills in the south of Australia, Hills Radio. They are using our uh, portable IP codec into their outside broadcast uh, when they go to cover several uh, faraway areas in Australia. They just go with that and the modems and they connect. Another equipment, another piece of uh, AEQ that is also in use in the Coast FM in Windyard, Tasmania, Australia. They use audio over IP lines uh, and uh, they is their outside broadcast gear which they use and now in the pandemic days uh, they are using the same alio in this uh, nice uh, suitcase that our dealer in australia is uh, preparing for the clients they are using the alio to work from home so here they have a radio studio where they have the microphone the headsets they can have an external mixer or they can mix in the alio they can remote control the station from the pc the console in the station and thanks to the audio it sounds like if they were at they were at the station so again we are working from home um to finish and to give uh completeness or to give a broad view of the working from home matter which is a quite uh, quite topic interesting matter these days um we are aware that there are many many seed uh, phones uh, programs software that works uh, sometimes better, sometimes worse, sometimes in a professional way, sometimes uh, in not the quality we are supposed to work in professional field. But uh, these seed points that you can find on the on the on the on the websites you can find on the Google Play or in Amazon, not Amazon, but the the EOS uh, app store. Uh, they have algorithms, they can work, some of them, they can work on professional algorithms like Opus. Uh, for instance, we can mention here Linfon and Lucilight. For this, uh, you need, uh, here we have a colleague from Spain uh, that he's using his professional microphone with a Bluetooth device or, or a transformer or whatever to connect it to the mobile phone. And from the mobile phone, he can connect the, the SIP, uh, I mean, the IP codec on the studio. So for these uh, applications, AQ can support you with the SIP lines that you can use to interconnect third-party devices or like a Linfon to make a call to AQ, uh, to another AQ device or to another IP codec anywhere. And you can use these, uh, these simple applications to run occasional, occasional contributions from home or from your uh, journalist or from your guest uh, so they can be on air on a very professional matter. Um, just to continue with the presentation, uh, just to tell you that uh, before we go to the to the final case, to another case, and we see a uh, Sergio continues, just to tell you that uh, well, uh, the SIP phones and uh, can be connected through audio codex to our intercom systems. Uh, AQ is. Uh, manufacturing intercom systems also for television. So this is an application for our television colleagues who are today with us. Uh, television outside broadcast is getting easier and it's getting more economic, more affordable, and we are having more and more outside broadcast interviews uh, because now the technology has allowed to make it in a very simple way. So 
AQ can provide you the technology so you can connect and give feedback to the journalist in a very simple and very efficient and high quality way. Um, just uh, before we have a look at the final case and the second case that Sergio will introduce us today, uh, we want uh, Sergio wants to show you for a little time uh, how to operate the the codex from a, in a simple way because he has shown you that uh, Sarsa is uh, has shown you the control system in Sarsa, but obviously we cannot start fiddling and playing with Sarsa equipment. So we have our own pieces of equipment which are sitting in our office in in Madrid, and Sergio is very very pleased to show you how to use the control Fenis, which is our control software that you can you have with every codex. So here in the screen you will see. Uh, here is uh, the start. Sergio has prepared for us five codecs, and he's going to give you a very brief explanation about how easy it is to make IP calls. Okay, please, Sergio, go ahead. Okay, okay. I'm back. So, uh, as I promised, I will show you how to operate the codecs with our standard control software. Okay. In this case, we are not focusing on a very large installation with a lot of uh, codecs, but uh, we are now explaining how to operate a small number of, of them. And in order to do that, I have just prepared a small installation in uh, my PC in uh, AQ office. I'm connected uh, from home uh, to this PC using a standard uh, remote control software as a desk in this case. And as you can see, we, are, we have the, the software running here, and the aspect is very different to what we saw before. This is because we are now operating in graphic mode. We can uh, simply switch between both modes, uh, both modes, normal side, that is this physical, uh, this uh, uh, graphical uh, mode, and this mode, that is what we saw before with the uh, SAS. Okay? Uh, when the number of codecs is small, it's more convenient to have them already maximized, so you can check the status of uh, all of them at the same time. Okay, in this case, we have uh, three codecs here at the left. Uh, one is a Venus 3, the second is a Stratos, and third is also a, a Venus 3. And at the left, we have an Phoenix Helio, uh, uh, the one that uh, Antonio showed you before, and a Phoenix Studio. A studio is a very similar device to Stratos, okay? Um, all of them are located in the same network as the, as the PC, so they are located physically close to this PC, but uh, the studio. The studio is uh, in the internet, it is uh, a separate uh, location, and this is the test unit we use for uh, offering uh, the customers uh, the possibility to test connections by themselves, and uh, this is publicly available 24 hours a day uh, with uh, uh, music uh, all the time. Okay, so uh, as you can see, we have different colors for the units. Uh, this is a uh, feature we have in the software. We can color uh, in the codex individually or by uh, device type uh, in order to more easily locate them. And um, as you can see uh, in the Alio, for example, we can easily access its configuration as we saw before. Uh, all the configuration of the inputs, outputs, the coding algorithm, the uh, interface mode we use, uh, as you can see, we can, we can select here if we operate in proxy SIP, direct SIP, and RTP, as we explained before in the connections uh, mode. And uh, in the case of ALIO, for example, we can also access the internal mixer. <coughs> as you can see here, we can, in real time, we can uh, adjust if it's microphone level, where we are sending it to, to the program or the coordination, channel one or channel two uh, uh, channels. Uh, we can uh, control bass, treble, uh, phantom if we need it. Uh, we can adjust the preamplified gain to adjust to very different microphones. We can also select microphone or online for the fourth input. We can adjust the listening level for the, the two headphones and the line output and what we are listening to also, etc. And this is all done in real time and in parallel with the uh, device surface. So uh, everything that is changed here will be, will be reflected in the surface and uh, the other way around in real time. So we can control everything in the unit. In, in fact, we can even forbid several uh, different actions in the local panel. So if we rely on or we let 
the unit to a person that is not very uh, trained, very well trained, we can forbid that he makes uh, calls or he hangs up calls or he adjusts levels or whatever individually. Okay. And we can also have a, a view meters for checking the, the, the levels of inputs and outputs okay, in real time. And uh, okay, uh, the application also has uh, some other uh, features like uh, contacts, uh, call books management. We can create uh, call book entries and store them in the PC or in the devices themselves. So it's very easy to make a call without having to remember IP addresses or uh, using names or whatever. Um, okay, we can also add, um, check the versions of the firmware of the all the units at, uh, at a glance. We can uh, manage uh, the coding algorithms and profiles in, in case of using SAP. SAP. Uh, we can check events um, and create logs just to check that everything is uh, going on properly. Etc. There are many options in this software that maybe they are beyond the scope of this webinar, but I'm, of course, open to your questions at the end of it in the questions uh, tone. And uh, I don't want to leave uh, this uh, without showing you how to make uh, calls. For example, uh, I have prepared channel ones uh, in both codecs in proxy ship. They are registered in our free ship server. Okay. And in order to make a call from Channel one in the ALU to channel one in the Phoenix Master. We just click on this button, just type the, the name or use an already created contact here. I already created an, a call book uh, entry name uh, Phoenix Master SA, SAP channel one. So I just click on it, click on call, and as you can see, the call is established bidirectionally uh, between channel one and channel one of both codes. Okay, as simple as that. Okay. If we want to make a RTP call using a smart RTP, uh, it's not much more uh, complicated. Okay, so in channel two, I have already configured both of them to operate in RTP mode. I have already activated a smart RTP option in both of them. And in order to make a call from the ALIO to the studio, for example, uh, if we are making a, a contribution from an external location, we just click here, type the, the public IP address and port of the remote end, in this case, the studio, or uh, we can also do the same, prepare a uh, call book entry here with uh, the, the IP address and port already written here and this way we don't need to remember it just click call and as you can see the, the studio codec uh, received the calls and makes the call the other way around so it's uh, basically the same the call is now made uh, by directionally and you have uh, audio being received from uh, the studio so it's not more much more complicated uh, if the configuration is uh, already made in the router the ports are open and, and, and that things it's as simple as that. Okay, so this is uh, basically uh, all with the uh, control Phoenix. Uh, of course, as I told you, there are many more details, but I will let uh, Antonio continue. And uh, in the questions, uh, Tom, we can we can answer. Okay. There we are. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sergio. Um, just go you go very quickly because there are a lot of questions, very interesting questions from for Sergio. Uh, questions coming from a lot of colleagues and people from all around the world. Uh, just to see very quickly that uh, small detail about the AQ Phoenix, Phoenix family of codecs. We start with a small Mercury, which is one uh, the basic model, which is having a stereo input a balance transformer XLR input and output. Uh, is uh, in this uh, small codec you have the ACBU, uh, they are optional, so it's a very good codec for starting, establishing one of these small radio links uh, that Sergio has uh, explained. Migrate your, uh, your uh, traditional link to an IP link with a couple of these simple devices that has all the functionalities to run very smoothly and very well uh, an IP link. Um, the next uh, is the Venus 3, which is the one that Sarsa is using in their network in Catalonia, in Barcelona. It's a more advanced uh, unit with more uh, 
capacity because you start with two uh, IP circuits that you can use in uh, to establish two stereo communications. If you have multiple programs in your STLs, you can run it with the Venus. Uh, if you have uh, to transmit to several places, different places, you can do it also. Uh, and this is coming with, uh, again, XLRs, uh, transformer inputs, transformer balance, inputs and outputs, ACBU, GPIs, uh, networks. Uh, and this one is working with Dante with AS67. A lot of clients, they ask us, uh, they ask, uh, what is this codec supporting out over IP? Yes, this codec is already supporting out over IP. So you can connect to the rest of the audio network in the station using uh, audio over IP. And to finish into the family of uh, rack mounted equipment, the legacy equipment is the Stratos, which is uh, basically you see is like um, it's like a Venus. This part is exactly like a Venus, where you have your IP connections, but it's also providing uh, ISDN uh, connectivity and V.35. There's still been little number of clients in the world who are still demanding ISDN links and V35, still working on all STLs and they need these pieces of equipment. Uh, you have the front panel in case you want to operate in the old fashioned way with the panel. Uh, but of course, all these codecs we strongly recommend as Sergio has uh, shown you to run it uh, via in the codec, via uh, one PC. And to finish, before we go to the second case that we're going to introduce today uh, from, uh, from our colleagues in Taiwan, uh, just to tell you a little bit about our uh, portable device with the mixer, which is having uh, four microphone inputs and one analog stereo line input and output, where you can do mix minus, you can do a combination of uh, different things, transmission modes. You have uh, everything on the front panel, of course, you can control everything on the front panel, but uh, as Sergio explained you, uh, we, this, uh, the bigger advance you have in this device is that you have the help button, so the journalist or the person working from home, he can just click and automatically the control flies to the station. So from the station, you can uh, control in full the, the device and you don't need to have a skilled operator on the other end. He just need to plug to the router at home and then the control you do from the station. This is uh, very nice for radio and for television. In radio, you can establish up to two channels so you can have uh, uh, or one stereo channel in the left, you can put the program on the right, you can put the pre-listening so you can give both signals to the uh, your talent working from home. Or in television, you can give in the program and you can give in a technical coordination channel. Um, what else we can tell you? Two languages, if you are doing a program in two languages, you can do from one device, you can have two commentators. Still, the people we cannot speak in two languages yet at the same time, but you can have two commentators working in the same audio and through the same IP line again to the studio. So, without uh, any more delay, because oof, there are a lot of questions, I would like to give answer in the questions and answers time later after this case. We're going to finish with another case study. Uh, more simple than Sarsa, more of the level of uh, hundreds of broadcasters in, in Indonesia, in Taiwan, in China, in India, Iran, many places, um, which was run, it's a multiple unicast that uh, Sergio will explain us how this works. Uh, this is our colleague, this is our uh, colleagues from Taiwan, uh, where the company ADE, that they run this uh, this uh, deployment, this installation, and this is uh, my colleague Jason Yang. That unfortunately, due to his working schedule, he couldn't join us today. This is a picture from the other day, and uh, he made this uh, installation, and uh, he will show us. Uh, Sergio will be in charge of explaining us today uh, just how they plan, how they realize, and there is a small part uh, very funny and anecdotic about the problems they face because we face problems every day on the installations and how they solve it. And immediately just uh, I let my colleague Sergio and we go we go through this case and we can go in through the questions and answers. So please Sergio, it's all yours. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you Antonio. Okay, uh, well Jason did a very good job uh, the other day um, uh, explaining all of this but I will try to substitute him and, and try to, to let you know uh, what they did, uh, what they wanted to do, and the problems they, they faced, and how uh, did they solve that using our uh, equipment. 
Okay, so the customer, uh, basically, what they, they wanted to do is to distribute the program to several different places, the same audio to several different places. And uh, initially, they were using uh, APT codecs, but uh, they were using uh, four APT codecs at the origin, at the, at the, source, the source size, site, uh, and another uh, four codecs, one and, uh, at each uh, listening uh, location, uh, destination location. Okay, so um, as you can imagine, this is not uh, very optimal because uh, they were using a, a large bandwidth, they were using more codecs than the, it's really need, needed, and they were using um, more IP addresses than uh, necessary. Okay, so, um, okay, um, well, uh, Antonio or uh, the sales manager uh, told them uh, about the, the possibility to do that uh, with the AQ codecs using a special feature that the, our codecs have that is more is called sorry a multiple uh, unicast and it's the ability to send the same audio stream to different IP addresses to different destinations okay so in this case you need to uh, rely on a network that is able to do a uh, multicast to support multicast and IEMP. Uh, this is the was the case we explained before with Sarsa, with Sarsa and that's a very large installation and uh, it's not possible to do this so they have to uh, hire a very expensive uh, network that supports uh, multicast okay so the network does that in this case when it's not uh, a, a very uh, not a very large number of the destinations are required like four in this case five ten maybe uh, destinations uh, is, is, is enough you can do it directly with the codec okay so uh, the origin the source codec will make replicas will make uh, copies of the codec and code the stream of course uh, the bandwidth of the of each connection will be multiplied by the number of uh, destinations but uh, using opus is not a very big deal we are talking about maybe one megabit per second it's available today in many connections many simple and inexpensive connections and uh, this way they only use one codec in the source end and another codec for receiving in its uh, location okay uh, so it's a very convenient uh, and very good working uh, solution okay uh, next slide we see that uh, they geographically covered uh, Taiwan okay and they use uh, Phoenix Stratos as the source uh, for the for the audio Okay, they could have used any other AQ uh, Phoenix audio codec, but they have Stratos, and they use Venus 3 as the receivers. Okay, uh, if they only needed one channel, they could have used uh, Mercury, of course. Uh, they choose they chose uh, Opus Stereo at 192 kilobits per second. That is the best uh, quality Opus algorithm we can we offer in, in our codecs, and they follow our recommendation to use that, and they are. Uh, happy with that because of its low delay and low bandwidth okay so they have more free bandwidth uh, for other uses like cctv cameras in this case or, or, or whatever and they also have released a number of uh, ip addresses that they, they don't need us they don't need four codecs in the transmitter side okay so uh, they installed uh, everything okay and uh, even it uh, they, they put that to work uh, they they complained that uh, they didn't get the stability they expected in some cases so uh, the um, the dealer there AD, AD, um was a bit worried because uh, that uh, was supposed to be uh, to become a nightmare because uh, the contact uh, the customer uh, was going to co to contact them uh, in holidays uh, during the night so they were uh, expecting a lot of trouble and they, they needed to solve, to solve that of course so uh, what we uh, what we wanted to, to to do here is to help them and in order to do that uh, we can take uh, take advantages uh, of the way we can control the codex remotely okay so uh, we can diagnose, diagnose and uh, we can solve uh, most of the uh, troubles uh, remotely okay and in order to do that, uh, they installed uh, Phoenix uh, control software, the, the software I already showed you before. Okay, and with the help of uh, AQSAT, uh, they were able to remotely control the five involved 
codex, the transmitter one and the four receiver codex. And um, they can also, uh, they, they could also install some auxiliary uh, software, or we can see in, the, in this, uh, this uh, slide uh, how this looks like. like. Just like before, we can see all five codex in the, in the same screen using a, a license um, a version of the, of the control software. And they also installed, as I was telling, uh, another uh, auxiliary software like the uh, InfoView, that is a very simple uh, freeware uh, software that uh, continuously sends ping requests to a list of uh, IP addresses and they can monitor the stability of the connections. Okay, and uh, they also use TeamViewer, that is uh, another uh, remote desktop application, just like uh, Nidesk or many others. Uh, Nidesk is the one that I used before to show you. Uh, the connection to Sarsa or, or the connection to, uh, to control fenice in AQ. And with this software, we can remotely control uh, control Phoenix in their installation from our office. So it's very uh, convenient for us to help them. Okay. So with the combination of these pieces of software, control Phoenix, uh, the ping info you and the uh, team viewer, they could determine uh, determine that uh, the IP connection of Phoenix Stratos was not stable. Okay, so they were losing pings uh, from time to time. So they decided to to check the, the connection of the, that codec. They, they requested the customer to check the connection to the switch, the cable, etc. And uh, okay, and they finally found that the, the cause of all the trouble was uh, a broken cable. A cable that was uh, suffering humidity and was uh, being corroded, so uh, the connection one that was not stable. And so we was uh, we were very happy to to check that the solution to this was very simple: just to change the cable and protect it from the dew. And uh, okay, uh, just to let you know that uh, with the help of our SAT, the customer service, and uh, using very simple to use tools like our software for control and remote desktop, desktop application and a small utility for ping checking. Uh, we could uh, easily uh, diagnose the problem. And uh, finally, Jason, uh, the person in charge of ADA, ADA was uh, able to, to rest. Um, OK, so um, th important things about this installation. OK, they can solve uh, a distribution uh, Problem using a multicast, multi unicast uh, facility in our uh, audio codex, and how we usually support uh, our customers uh, using remote uh, control applications. Okay, so I pass to Antonio again. So thank you, Sergio. I just ask you not to go very far away because no, we are finishing today and we have a lot of questions which are very difficult and quite uh, complex to answer and you are the key person to do that so thanks to ADE again and the public station in Taiwan that uh, unfortunately we cannot uh, give the name of these stations because of uh, privacy agreements and all that and um, so just to finish before the questions and answers time and the, and the and the questionnaire that you will have at the end of the presentation uh, just to tell you that you never work alone here is all the AQ team uh, that we are at your disposal uh, in the factory in the R&D in the sales department in the support which is more important trying to make these days uh, much better uh, for all these pandemic days for us and the rest of the world so let's start as soon as possible uh, with the questions and answers that we have a list of very interesting questions of course most of them i cannot answer them i could answer but sergio is the person to do um sergio one uh, the first shot from our colleague ajay probably from india what binary rate for the connection to rtp relay server and for simple SIP server, what kind of binary rate? Okay, uh, the binary rate you need uh, at your codec end is the same. It uh, doesn't matter whether you are connecting using SIP or RTP or whatever, because SIP signaling is very, very uh, small, count of bytes is uh, very, very small, and it's also acting during the establishment of the connection, where uh, when audio is still not present. So 
the the gross of the of the bandwidth is required by audio okay it doesn't matter if you're using rtp uh, zip relay or whatever okay uh, and um, depending on, on the coding algorithm you are using uh, we are talking about one bandwidth or another okay as an example uh, i saw you before that with opus and less than 200 kilobits per second you are done we always recommend uh, to have a, a guaranteed double of that just to, to account for uh, network issues or whatever so with 400 kilobits per second you are all done this is much less than the uh, offer by many standard chip uh, internet connections okay and in the if maybe your question goes uh, this way uh, in this SIP server if the SIP server uh, does rtp relay of course the connection of this SIP server needs to be uh, wider just to allow for the for the audio going in and out so in case you are installing your own uh, SIP server then you need to take uh, care about this but uh, if you're using our service or any other uh, provider service uh, you don't need to take care of about that your connection yeah. will be the same i see thank you sergio so the SIP servers uh, just as a commercial Note. piece of information uh, lots of broadcasters large broadcasters using a lot of ip codecs they are using now their own uh, SIP servers uh, we have supported from aq the installation of several SIP servers for several radios that radio networks in the world so and the and the key always sergio says is the matter of the two times uh, have two times the bandwidth and uh, it will work <laughs> also it's not that easy at me in practice because this is why we have zip relays and sergio knows a lot of uh, uh, get because what we have shown you today in the ip codes i think is only the tip of uh, a lot of things that are underneath just in case something goes wrong so for instance another question from mohammed is related to this uh, what is the typical domestic dsl connection that you recommend to use a phoenix from home to work from home what is the minimum okay uh, okay this uh, the market of uh, dcl or fiber or whatever connections evolves every day so i don't know what is the uh, the, the standard uh, fee the standard uh, bandwidth uh, they offer in your country for example but uh, here in spain it's not uncommon to have very cheap a connection about 30 megabits per second maybe okay so this is more or less the standard nowadays we are talking that you need like 400 kilobits per second so i think it's safe to say that uh, any today's available uh, adcl connection will be more than enough as long as you have uh, more than that and uh, for the uplink and the downlink of course okay so you need to check that your connection is symmetric uh, it's not uh, it's not adequate if you have 30 megabits per second downlink and uh, one kilobit per second uplink. Okay, it's not the case, but uh, you need to check that. Okay? So yes, uh, from the commercial side, always uh, bandwidth and quality of services related to what you pay. Uh, so uh, the more you pay for the service, this is a very direct and simple way. The more you pay for the service, the better quality you have. So even the more bandwidth they give you is not that they're giving you assuring you any quality of service or anything so this is why we put in the in the codex many many uh, many many operational facilities to keep this working so related to this again the working from home matter with the alios and all that uh, how do we configure the alio at remote uh, end for initial session i mean can you explain the people here if me somebody who is now uh, working with ip codes every day comes home with an alio or the alio comes by by the courier and i have the microphone the alio what can i do sergio what can i do to establish a connection with the office with the station? okay what what we uh, usually recommend to our customers is that the, um, they prepare the alio first in the in the in the studio okay uh, just to to uh, to create, for example, the, the call uh, book entries, just to make uh, things easier to the, to the user. But in any case, the only, thing, the only thing you need to do usually is to connect your audio to your ethernet connection, as you do with your PC, to your router, okay? Set it uh, to DHCP, that is, uh, I think this is the factory mode, okay? So it automatically gets 
configure, it gets uh, the IP address and gateways and, and everything automatically. So uh, as long as you plug it, you have the, your unit ready to, uh, to send audio to the internet. And then you need to know the, the IP uh, address of the, the studio, the, the, the location you are going to send your audio to, okay? If you're working with SIP, okay, you, our units are already registered in our SIP server. So if you use uh, SIP, uh, your unit is ready to work uh, to make SAP calls. So you, you will be very easy for you to, to make a call, a test call to our test unit, just dialing Phoenix Master. Okay, it's all in the manual, but uh, uh, as long as you uh, connect it and, and it is VHCP uh, configured, you can make a, a zip test call to our unit. And if the unit in the, in your studio, the remote location, is also registered in our server, you you will be able to make zip calls very easily from one side to the other. Okay, if you are going, if you are not going to use SIP uh, and you are going to be able to configure a bit more things in the in the studio in the router. You can go with a, a smart RTP, and then, uh, as I said, as I said, you only need to know the, the public IP of the studio and, uh, and the assigned port. And if everything is properly configured in the studio by the IP people, uh, it should reach the the studio codec, so the call will be established. Okay, thank you, Sergio. Or you can and, call. Uh, it. Yeah, please. Uh, so, more calls, uh, more questions from uh, many people, Rob, Navas, many people. Um, uh, for the Alio, uh, what kind of networks uh, can we use for the Phoenix Alio, public or private? Uh, can we use an Alio in an STL link via wire internet at remote location? Uh, yes. Public, <laughs> private, which okay. model? Yeah. Okay, and all the codecs in our line are equivalent in terms of uh, network, so uh, it doesn't matter if it is an Alio, a Venus, a Mercury, a Stratos, whatever, they use the same kind of uh, coding algorithms, the same kind of uh, network connections, the same communication modes, RTP, uh, proxy, and direct SIP. So it's, uh, uh, it, it's not important what kind of uh, model it is. Okay, and uh, private or uh, dedicated network. Okay, uh, depends on what you, of what you want to do. Uh, I explained before, you can do everything mm -hmm. uh, using internet if you have a proper internet connection. Uh, if you want to make a multicast, for example, you need a dedicated uh, a network with multicast capability and just to broadcast to many different locations. If you want to make simple point-to-point -point contributions, you can use almost any network available that gives access to the internet. And the only thing you need to take care of is that you can reach the other end. That's it. You need to know the public IP of the other end or to be registered in the same SIP server if you are going to, to use SIP. Yeah. In another, this is a... no. Yes, we see. Related to the SIP matters, uh, well, they ask us uh, questions. Uh, Ahmed is asking very, something very simple, something that I can answer myself, which is, uh, uh, can we customize the name of the SIP registries and say, yes, uh, I have one, actually, I have one account, which is called Antonio at SIPAQ.es, uh, that Sergio very kindly, he gave me, he registered with this name. So, and if you have your own SIP server, you can customize, you can give it a name, you can, uh, it's like Skype. It's, uh, the engineers, they don't like to give these examples, but it's uh, on a simple way to understand. This is very similar to, okay. to Skype. Uh, Skype in Skype we all have a name and uh, with our name we go all around the world home hotels uh, airports anywhere and Skype is looking for us uh, where we are so the SIP sample is uh, is very similar to that right okay. well I would like to add uh, to what Antonio said that is very true I would like to add that uh, you cannot change your user your URI your uh, uh, your name in the SIP server by yourself okay you have to contact uh, AQ so uh, we can provide you another account with a, another name because uh, by default all the units are sent with uh, mm, like random names or uh, well the, the passwords are random but the names are usually like a finished mercury uh, lead to seven. okay so, so okay. things like that so if you want to make a more friendly name for your account you have to contact 
AQ and we need to change that in the server. Okay, so it's not something you can do by yourself. Okay. Our I see. So we have a, another couple of questions from um, my colleague Jatish from India. Uh, he's asking first if the ALIO can be used as a commentary unit. Yes, commentary unit only. Yes, you, this is, uh, you have a mixer, you have uh, two channels. Uh, actually, you have uh, three audio channels inside. Uh, one uh, internal tollback between the commentators and two audio channels. Uh, with the limitation of two inputs, two outputs, uh, you can run it as a, a small commentary unit. Commentary units uh, from AEQ and from other manufacturers, uh, normally they have multiple feedbacks uh, from different sources in public address, uh, um, guide, remote technicians, whatever, but uh, the, the ALIO is a commentary unit uh, with limited number of inputs and outputs with a codec inside, with the IP codec inside. And related to this, uh, questions like uh, coding, what coding algorithms to use, the, the, more band, the more audio quality with the minimum bandwidth transmission, and asking how much latency will be uh, if it was in a 4G SIM. Well, uh, I don't think there is nothing established about uh, once the audio comes out uh, the codec, is not in our reach, it's not in our control. Uh, the internet, uh, the 4G, 3G is uh, open, is an open field. And I think we experience these things in Skype, in uh, WhatsApp, in our communications, in our IP communications. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. Uh, AQ is giving you the SIP relay servers to improve this situation. But uh, of course, our codecs, they work on 4G, 5G, 3G but it all depends on the quality of the service they are giving you in that moment. Uh, is, that, is that right, Sergio, more or less? Uh, well, uh, just but, uh, to give an indication uh, with 3G or 4G communications, if you have good coverage, the delays is, uh, are not usually a, a, a trouble, but uh, if the signal is not very good or if the coverage is not very good or the network quality is not very good, you will have some jitter. Jitter is variation in the delivery of uh, the time of delivery of the package, and then you have to configure some buffering in the in the codec. Okay, so this buffer helps you have a more stable connection, but adds on the delay. Okay, so if, for example, if you had a half a second buffer, you will have half a second delay plus uh, the network delay. Okay, so you add something on top of that. So you need to be careful of this. The Thank better you, the Francis. network it is, the, the lower the delay you, you will need to configure. Mm -hmm. so, and of course, always the, the lower bandwidth you use, the better it will run. And in audio, luckily, the, the level of uh, signal, the level of uh, flow, data flow that we have to put into the internet is getting smaller and smaller thanks to things like Opus. Uh, simple questions like uh, what is the requirement for PC, Windows? Windows application and the flow of data is, is, for instance, to control the transmitter site from the station is very, very low, Sergio, I think. Yeah, 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 of course. So, if let's focus. You want to use, sorry, uh, just to, to, to illustrate some customers' experience, if you want to run control things from a, a Apple, Apple computer, for example, you can use a virtual machine. So, people, some, some people do that. Okay. Mm -hmm. So just uh, passing a little bit to the matter of the STLs, some questions about STLs like Frederick asking, uh, um, for instance, does the Phoenix uh, family offer any automatic reboot and call when electricity problems happens in the transmission site? So Sergio, can you explain what is the facilities the codex have just in case something unexpected happens? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. You have an option in the control things that you can activate for the codec and in case uh, something happens with the connection, uh, for example, if uh, a power uh, cut, uh, when power is recovered, uh, the codec will call to the same uh, address that it, uh, it was uh, calling before uh, the cut. So, so this, uh, I, almost every situation, uh, Ethernet cut, uh, power cut, etc., is covered and properly configured both, both ends, you, you can always recover the connection automatically. So this is covered. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, uh, we are finishing. Um, they asked me about uh, how long can we make STL connection with these codecs? I'm not sure well, if they're referring about uh, uh, 
uh, how long a code can stay working for uh, no, there is no course, there is no limit for that okay we have uh, customers running it stls uh, 24 7 for months or uh, years so uh, mm -hmm. no problem for that so yes um and uh, finally there is a final question uh, there are several questions about the compatibility uh, compatibility with uh, the using of uh, zip servers and other makers of ip codex uh, yes uh, if you want to give a technical overview of the compatibility matters mm -hmm. okay usually all the modes we use are uh, compatible are open uh, for some RT rtp is a standard in fact if you use sip the audio uh, at the end travels in rtp so RTP, most codecs from the third parties support uh, rtp what they don't support is uh, maybe a smart rtp so the connection is a bit hard to establish so uh, usually when, when you want to interoperate with a, a third party uh, codecs uh, you uh, or customers tend to use sip and sip is a standard is a recommendation and a, a compatibility is ensured at least in, in several coding modes okay yeah, maybe it's more difficult to be compatible in uh, AAC or uh, MP3 or whatever, but in G722 or Opus, uh, better and better uh, every day, uh, we usually are compatible with uh, many, many brands. Okay, um, just a couple of final questions about Sarsa. Uh, Jeff is asking, uh, what is the kind of IP network is using Sarsa? I think it's, uh, can you explain? Yes, Sarsa is. Uh, is uh, hiring a dedicated network uh, from the from a major uh, national uh, internet provider in Spain. Okay, so uh, they okay, they agreed. They explained them the requirements. They explained them the number of destinations. So they calculated the required bandwidth at each point. They told them they they needed to support multicast. So they. Uh, gave them uh, a list of requirements in terms of quality of service, bandwidth, as I told you, etc. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they got a quotation from the provider to, to offer and to support and maintenance and give maintenance to this uh, network. So it's a dedicated service and it may be very different in, from one country to, to another. So you should ask your provider. So the case of SARSA is. Um... The case of SARSA is a very specific matter that you have to negotiate with the telecom company. But it seems uh, they are interested also in the case of Taiwan, the case of Jason. That uh, are they using dedicated links or how uh, the multiple unicast? Uh, is there a maximum in uh, transmission? Can we put one codec and uh, we say, okay, you see that SARSA to do it to 200 needs to have a multicast, but between the one to one and the SARSA, what is in the middle? Yeah, in the middle it is uh, this multi-unicast multi uh, feature in our codex, but uh, you can expect them uh, to make uh, a limited number of uh, distributions. Okay, so it's not easy to say the exact number of uh, at this limit, but uh, because it depends on the quality of your network and also depends on the algorithm you are using. Okay, so, uh, but we can uh, say that, for example, for Opus uh, connections, you can make a uh, in between five and ten uh, simultaneously connection okay if you are going to to do more than say five uh, this is something that should be tested before truly okay to ensure that the uh, quality is uh, adequate in all the connections but uh, we are talking about these numbers okay if mm -hmm. you want to make two three four five connections you're okay if you want to yeah. make more uh, you have to test that and if you are requiring 20 or more connections you're better use two or three codecs to to uh, to balance the load, okay, and to make, for example, five connections each one and, and enter the same audio to all of them, okay. You can you can go with that. And you, if you need two hundred connections, you better look for another solution like multicast with a network, etc. So yes, in line with this, they're asking how do you know if there is a limit of multiple unicast that you have explained. How do you know if it's possible to do multiple unicast? Uh, I think it's a matter of uh, try and error to see, to put the yes. audio there and see what happens. 
okay, we can provide some guidance. Uh, we can tell you, okay, this is of course not going to work, or this is of course going to work. But there is a, a number of uh, receivers that we need to tell you, okay, you should test that in your network, okay? So we will help you test the solution first, and in case it doesn't work, you can always split into two transmitters instead of one, for example. Mm -hmm. So for instance, they ask us is just a, a complex or a stream case. If the codec sends and compress audio in multicast, what will be the bandwidth required for each link? Okay, uh, if we need to distinguish between multicast and multi unicast, okay? If we are going to use multicast, the network must support that. Internet, of course, doesn't support multicast, okay? And in, 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 in the case of multicast, the connection for your transmitting codec is just the same as, as if you were only making one connection, okay? Because you deliver one connection to the network and the network itself uh, duplicates it. Okay, so you don't need to, uh, you don't need to take care about the bandwidth of this uh, connection. It's on, it's like only one channel. If you are going to do multi unicast, then you need to multiply uh, the number of uh, replicas by the bandwidth consumed or draw, but uh, by only one connection. Okay, but if we are talking about less than ten, uh, usually we are going to talk about less than uh, one or two megabits per second. But it's usually available by most uh, ADCI connections. Mm -hmm. We need to make the Yeah, thank you, Sergio. So it's always a, a there is always a lot of question marks uh, about these uh, multiple unicasts, which looks like magic uh, <laughs> protocols that uh, we don't need, as in the case of JSON, we don't need uh, four codecs uh, in one end, four codecs on the other end, or 200 uh, to broadcast from Barcelona to every single radio station, but everything uh, they are there is always a lot of advantages. Um, we have several questions about the hardware, about uh, the, if the codex supports AS67, yes. Uh, for instance, um, coming to the Venus, uh, for instance, they ask us a very typical question because they only see the front panel. And uh, though we have uh, some friends from South Africa uh, today, they're asking, does the Venus, Venus has uh, any on board monitoring function, so you can monitor the outgoing feed, how we can monitor in the Venus? Okay, yeah, uh, the basic way to monitor everything with the Venus or, the, or other codecs without front controls is using the software, okay? You can use Control Phoenix to check the view meters. They are precision and real-time view meters. You can check everything with them. Uh, there is also a, an activity, a uh, LED in the front panel that uh, is a audio alarm that you can configure. It's a timeout and also it's threshold. So you can use that to check if there is audio or, or there is not uh, received audio. Okay, and uh, you also have uh, some statistics in the control finish and also in the web server in, uh, incorporated inside the, the unit. You also have a web page that you can uh, open in your uh, mm -hmm. browser and you can check the statistics of your connections, like uh, lost packets, uh, jitter, uh, uh, uptime of the unit, and also of each call, etc. Yeah, so you have to be always keep an eye on the on the statistics uh, and the equipment. And uh, the more information is in the software, is in the via PCs, because these codecs are made to operate in from PCs with large number of uh, units to be controlled. Uh, but in any case, you always have something in the front panel, just as, as Sergio says, the critical alarms are on the front, on the front panel. More questions about the Alio, like uh, more uh, features questions like uh, battery. Uh, how can I, can I operate the Alio on the battery? Yes, uh, you can. The Alio is working on 12 volts. Uh, I know from our colleagues in Australia that they are plugging to the car battery, so they can stay working for days on the Alio. <laughs> As long as the as the IP connection is still alive, uh, if um, the modems, where can I buy the modem for the Alio? Only in AEQ? No, we were telling you that uh, you can buy the modem anywhere in the world. Uh, AEQ has decided not to add complexity to the equipment, not to put the modem inside. Uh, you can buy a modem which is uh, like this, similar to a mobile phone, and you can have the wire connection to the to the Alio, and from there you can transmit uh, through this uh, 3G, 4G, 5G modem. 
Um, one more question. If we need an extra SIP account, how we can obtain it? Speak with us, talk with the ATU sales department, and we will provide you SIP accounts in, in numbers, in packages, as you require. And uh, the support department will help you with the setup or web communications. Uh, compatibility. Something uh, related to the microwaves. Uh, Sergio, if we have some, just a few last minutes to, to mm -hmm. talk. Uh, they asked me about what is the maximum distance in these radio links? What is the frequency they use uh, in, with the phone? Okay, there is a, a very wide market for this. Uh, I, I know that the free band units operate in the 2.5 to up to 5 gigahertz bands. They use uh, free, free bands. Okay, and they advertise uh, ranges up to 30, 30 kilometers or so, depending on the model. Okay, of course, you need to have very good weather conditions and very good visibility uh, between one point and the other in order to achieve that. But okay, if you are going to run five kilometers, it, it will go fairly well. But mm -hmm. I told you before, if you are going to use non-licensed uh, Chip uh, links uh, expect for interference or some kind of problems. Maybe you will you need to be prepared. And uh, and the um, and the license bands. Uh, I don't know. There are many uh, license, uh, many many frequency bands and many models. But they also, they always operate in the gigahertz range just to 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 be able to to send uh, high speeds. Mm -hmm. Because uh, they, they, uh, some of them offer up to 100 megabits per second or something like mm -hmm. that. So yes, uh, always there, is, there are questions about security, security in the transmission, security in the uh, security in the transmission in terms of reliability and security itself. If if the mm -hmm. bandwidth can be interrupted, if the transmission can be interrupted, uh, I think this is out of our scope of. Uh, of uh, operation as, as AQ, as manufacturer of Codex. We live with these uh, inconveniences, we live with the advantages and with the disadvantages of the technology. So there is very little AQ can help you on the matter of the privacy. Uh, the more, as I told you before, with the bandwidth and with the quality of service, the more you spend, the better you will get uh, always. So, I think this has been all for today. Um, we don't have any more questions at this moment. So if you have any questions, uh, of course, you can uh, do it in the, send us an email to me or to marketing. And uh, thank you for, thank you, Sergio, first of all, thank you to thank give you. us the chance to, to uh, be with our clients uh, today. Thanks to Sarsa uh, in Catalonia, in Barcelona for the collaboration. Uh, thanks to Jason that unfortunately he was not able to be here with us today. Thanks him for uh, uh, giving us this uh, case of multiple unicast. And uh, just to thank you all for being with us. Uh, this day is almost taking two hours now and uh, I hope it's been uh, useful. Hope you have learned something that you can use in your daily practice. And if you need anything from us, here we are at AQ uh, just to help you and to support you in these days. Take care. Be safe and uh, we'll meet again. We'll meet again very soon in the exhibitions and in your stations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank all. you all. Take care.